Hey Bridgewater Church family and happy Holy Week. My name is Tracy and we are so glad that you have joined us for worship today. There are so many ways to get connected around here and we hope that you can be a part of it all. Check out this week's Bridgewater Buzz. This week is filled with special moments that we want to remind you about. Pray Where You Are begins immediately following the 11 a.m. service. Check out the calendar or online in the lobby to claim a prayer hour or to confirm the hour that you signed up for. This Thursday, April 14th, we'll be having a special Monday Thursday service here at the church at 6 p.m. An online experience will also be streaming on all platforms at the same time. On Easter Sunday, April 17th, we will be celebrating together in person at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Our kids programming happens during the 11 a.m. service and there will be a family Easter egg hunt immediately following out on the front lawn. You can help make this an extra special event by bringing in bags of individually wrapped candy and dropping them off in the lobby. We can't wait to spend this transformational week with you. The outreach team is partnering with 17 Strong, an organization that focuses on caring for neighborhoods here in Hamilton for an all serve Saturday. Join us on Saturday, April 30th from 10 a.m. to noon to help clean up the Riverview neighborhood. Kids eight and up are invited to join you, so this is a great opportunity to serve together as a family. Sign up in the lobby or email k at bwch.org for more information. Life Groups, this is our spring break week. We wanted to remind you that there will be no Life Groups meeting this Wednesday, April 13th, or on Easter Sunday. If you're not a part of a Life Group, this is a great time to get plugged into community as we head into our new session. Sign up in the lobby for more info and we will help you find the best fit for you. Thanks for joining us for worship today. God has incredible things in store, and we love being a part of the Bridgewater community with each of you. Good morning, and welcome to Bridgewater Church Online. Thanks for spending some spring time with us. You are joining us during our spring series, Without a Doubt. As we begin, we invite you to participate with us for worship in whatever space you're in. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, as we begin to be able to Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you online, and I hope you're ready to hear God's Word. This is an interesting series that we're in. We're talking about doubts. Everyone has them. Everybody asks questions about their hopes, their dreams. We, we struggle through uh, difficulties in life, and the one common thread is doubt. I was reading a great story about uh, a man named Charles Blondin. Now, I don't know if you know who Charles is, but he actually was the first man in 1859 to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Okay, now... Think about this. It's 1859. It's June 30th. 25,000 people show up to see him cross shortly before 5 p.m. He wore fine leather shoes. They were soft soles. But think about this. He had a balancing pole in his hand that weighed 50 pounds. It is incredible to picture this in our minds. And it was, it was a big deal. A band showed up, and they began to play Home Sweet Home. I don't really know what they were thinking, but they were playing this while he was crossing Niagara Falls. Calmly, coolly, he put the, the uh, balancing pole in his hand, and he walked halfway across, stopped, dropped a rope down to, even back then, they had a ship called, a boat called Maid of the Mist, 
And he pulled up a bottle of wine, took a drink, and finished the tightrope walk. People were ecstatic. How about this? He did that, it's been said, over 300 times. I like this story. After the initial crossing of Niagara Falls, he had to get people interested. And so on one occasion, he took a wheelbarrow and he went across with the wheelbarrow in his hands, came back across, stopped, and he looked at the onlookers and he said, isn't that exciting? He said, do you think I could put a person in the wheelbarrow and cross? Everybody, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, volunteers? Not one hand was raised. Why? Because of our word, doubt. It's one thing to believe that something can happen. It's a totally another thing to truly have the faith without doubt that you know that there is a God who is real and a Savior called Jesus Christ who died and rose again. Not just a belief, but a confident faith. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Now, we're going to go to a familiar story. We know it is the triumphal entry. Jesus is going to move into Jerusalem for ministry that would ultimately lead to his conviction, death on the cross, and being buried in a tomb. But before we ever get to the Friday known as Good Friday, I want to back all the way up to the entry into Jerusalem. And it's something that, that people had expected for, for years and years and years. But they just had so many doubts that what the prophet Zechariah had said was actually coming true. Look at this. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Picture yourself there. Do you believe it? There's no doubt in your mind that the Messiah, the long-awaited king of kings, was actually entering Jerusalem, without a doubt. I want to literally dig into this passage of Scripture found in Luke 19. And I want to pull out three titles. We maybe think of them as identifications that are given to Jesus. And they build one on the other. And I want to help us answer the question today, is Jesus really the king of kings? And it begins in Luke 19, 28 through 34. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and he approached Bethpage and Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Here's our first title. Jesus is Lord. It's unusual for us. We don't go around calling anyone Lord. We don't go around calling anyone uh, like they are the master of property. But if you're going to understand what's taking place here, this very first scene is crucial to understanding who Jesus really is. 
Jesus is preparing to go into Jerusalem. And I have to tell you, in my mind, I'm asking the question, why did Jesus want to, want to go through the front door? Why did Jesus literally want to move into Jerusalem by going through the front gates? But remember, we've already seen it was prophesied. And Jesus knew what his mission and his purpose was. I think he probably got some counsel that said, why don't we go in in the dark of the night? But Jesus, Jesus says no. In fact, I need two of you to go get a young colt or a young donkey, and I want you to bring the donkey to me. If I had been going to find a ride for Jesus, I would have been looking for a pimped out chariot. I would have been looking for a lot, something with more sparkle and glitz. And I think that's why these two disciples looked at Jesus and said, well, what do we say if we go get this donkey? What, what if somebody stops us? It, it looks like we're stealing. And are you sure you want a donkey to ride on into Jerusalem to make your Messiah big statement? Jesus just looks at the guys, go, go get the donkey. Go get it. It'll all work out. And when they get there, the question's asked. The property owner looks at them and goes, what are you doing with my donkey? Now, there's a play on words here that's, that's vital. It's vital to the story. They say, when they talk to the property owners, the disciples say, Lord, it's the lowercase indication that we recognize that you are the master or owner of the donkey. But this is how they answer, and you would only see this in the Greek, but with a capital L, the Lord needs it, and here's what it means, simplistically but beautifully. The creator of all things wants his donkey. And now, I, it's mind-blowing. I wish I had time to preach this. They just said, okay. How, how does that work? It would be like somebody coming to you and saying, you didn't know them at all. Hey, I need your car. And, and you go, that's my car. Well, the Lord, the creator of all things, wants your car. No problem. Go ahead. I, I'm just blown away by this. But here is the thing that I realize. The supreme creator and rightful owner of all things is Jesus Christ. If we're going to get a 10,000 foot view of who Jesus is, it has to start at this place where Jesus is Lord and Creator. Before we ever see him as king, without any doubts, the question is just, it's floating out there on the air. Do you believe he is the Creator? He is the owner of all things. Now, I found this so interesting, Stephen Ball. He's a Christian physicist. He did an entire work on understanding how this concept of creation through the Big Bang literally plays into biblical creation. But this is the conclusion he came to. Let me read it. Modern science is revealing the many factors that appear to be tuned just right for life, to be possible here on planet Earth. In short, science is confirming the validity of the Bible. This demands a personal response on our part. Can I just read that again? This demands a personal response on our part. To heed the messages being given, to acknowledge who the Creator is, and respond to His invitation to a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Wow. This first title, this identification, we have to start here. Jesus is Lord. Before we answer, is he the king of kings? Is Jesus really who he says he is as he prepares to ride into Jerusalem? First, you and I need to stop and say, is Jesus Lord? Is he the creator of all things? But then we see another title. It's in Luke 19, 35 through 38. 
They brought it to Jesus. This is the donkey. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Here's the next title. Jesus is Savior. It's one thing to see Jesus as creator. Uh, God, God as a higher power is, is pretty well accepted in our society. But is Jesus the Savior who would literally come to be our sacrifice for our sins and set us free? I want to go to Matthew's gospel because this same story breaks out this next understanding of Jesus in, in, in a very unique way. Look at Matthew 21, 9 through 10. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Now, I want you to think in your mind, do you really believe without a doubt that Jesus is not only Lord, but he's Savior? It's a huge question. We're not saying that it's okay for everybody to just believe whatever they want. No, no, no. I'm honing in. Where are you at? Do you believe if you had been in the crowd that day and Jesus was entering Jerusalem on this donkey, would you see him not just as creator, not just as miracle worker or teacher or rabbi, but would you literally without a doubt see Jesus as the Savior? Now the titles are interesting in this. The, the way that Jesus, let's call them his descriptions, the bystanders shouted out, Hosanna. The cry meant literally save. The very first thing that they say is, Son of David, save us. Here's what they were saying. They were saying, we know that the Messiah who comes will represent the line of David. He will be able to save, now are you ready for this? In their minds, he's going to save God's people. He's going to save the Jews. That's why they said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I want you to focus on in the name of the Lord. Here it is again. He's not only creator, but literally now they're saying, we believe that the Messiah is sent directly from God as God with us, God incarnate. God is the son, is sending the son as a gift to us. Then they say, Hosanna in the highest. They come back, and here's what they're saying this time is, there is no other like this Jesus. He is the Savior. He is the one foretold of in Isaiah 56, 4 through 6. Look at this. This passage of Scripture in Isaiah is incredible. We're told, surely he took up our pain. And bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep who have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you get this? He's not just creator, but he's savior. Now the Jewish people really thought he was going to save only God's people, but actually the titles that they're using to celebrate who Jesus is, they're literally saying he has the ability to save us from our sins. 
Only the king of kings could do that. I'm reminded when I was in India years ago, we were dedicating a church and it had been built for weeks. It had been finished. But until it was dedicated, no one could go in. And there was a ribbon across the door. And there was a long, long uh, dirt road that went directly into the village and right almost up to where the church had been built out in the middle of nowhere in this beautiful country called India. We were told that the people would be waiting on us and we were delayed. We were delayed by a couple of hours. Can you imagine this? The people in that village had been waiting to dedicate that church for weeks, but they stood there for hours until we got there. When our vehicle drove up to the road and they knew it was us, they began to shout. They began to praise God. They began to say, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. They were so excited. And as our vehicle passed, these people came in behind us until we all stood there together with the ribbon across the door. And then we had the beautiful opportunity, I was standing right there with the ribbon cutters to cut the ribbon and see all of the people go in with incredible, tremendous joy. That scene will never be forgotten in my mind, but that is just a glimpse of what took place there at the gates of Jerusalem when not only the creator of the world came in, but the Savior came in to save them from their sins. Hosanna, the son of David, God incarnate, we know that he is here to deliver us from ourselves. Do you believe that? Without a doubt, it is incredible. Can we go back and capture Luke 19, 38 again? And I want to add a couple of verses. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now listen to this. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you who he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Here's the third title. Combining what we've read now in Matthew's gospel and then in Luke. Jesus is the king of peace. Just say it there at home. Jesus is the king of peace. Now don't forget, in Matthew's gospel, we read it already, and I held on to it. I didn't want to unpack it yet because this is so exciting. The people were shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now Luke adds to that. He says, this is the king. But specifically what he's referring to is peace. This is the one who will bring the peace of God. How do you see God? Do you have doubts in your mind about who he is? Maybe it's easy to think of Jesus as creator, a higher power. Okay, that's fine. That's a great place to start. And maybe you can even think of him as savior. He died on a cross to set us free from our sins. But I want to know, is he the king of your heart? He's the ruler of all things. You're saying that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that this king, this Jesus king, came to give you peace. In fact, the story only makes sense if we understand Jesus is the king of peace, because any other divine king would have ridden in on a stallion. I'm picturing a white horse galloping through the streets with everyone crying out, Hosanna, son of God. The Savior's here, creator of all things. This is a king we can follow. And, and don't forget, that's what the Jewish nation thought that when the Messiah came, he would be a world dominion ruler. He would be the king of all earthly kings. But do you see it? Did you, did you capture it? 
Ironically, he rides in on a donkey, and a donkey for the Jewish people symbolized peace. The king of the Jews wasn't coming as expected. He was coming in on a donkey unexpectedly. And I think that's what the problem was for a lot of the Pharisees. They wanted Jesus to be exactly what they expected him to be. And that's why they were upset. I don't know exactly how it happened, but in my mind I picture it with Jesus riding into the city and a Pharisee says, Hey, hey, tell your disciples to quit shouting these things out and leading the crowd to believe that your Lord, Creator, that your Savior, Messiah, because our king wouldn't be riding in on a donkey. Tell him to knock it off. And Jesus, it's really the only words that we hear that Jesus shared as he rode into Jerusalem. Jesus says, I can tell him to stop, but if I do, the rocks will cry out. Doubts happen for all of us. Every one of us have doubts about God. We all struggle through moments in our lives, and maybe that's you right now. Maybe you can see God as creator. Maybe you can picture Jesus as a savior. But do you see Jesus as the king of kings who brings peace to your heart no matter what the struggles of life may bring. Do you see him bringing peace in the midst of the pain and the turmoil and the doubt? I think it actually would be easier at times for God to empower rocks to cry out. But he's not waiting on stones to shout praise. He's coming to you and to me. And all I can do is think of the words in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, now listen, and righteousness. From, the time, from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And that's exactly what Jesus, this King of Peace, did. That day as he rode into Jerusalem and the week of his passion and purpose began, All of heaven waited for him to die on a cross and be raised to life because without a doubt, Jesus was and Jesus is the King of Kings. I had the wonderful privilege of listening to my daughter Mary in the college choir at Indiana Wesleyan University. It was in December And we had gathered for a concert in an older church. It was gorgeous. It was decorated in greens. And there was this wonderful, old, glorious feel with the wooden pews and the beautiful stained glass and the candles that were burning. We had gotten there just a little late and we had to sit in the balcony. But I'm glad we did because they sang so many beautiful songs for that Christmas concert, but they ended with the Hallelujah Chorus. And I was sitting there just not wanting the night to end. But then in that moment, something incredible happened. It's supposed to happen every time the Hallelujah Chorus is sung. I don't know where the tradition began, but when that chorus begins to swell, People stand to their feet out of respect, out of love, out of adoration. And as this choir in this beautiful acoustically created room, in this reverent Christmas setting, began to sing the words of Scripture, 
and they sang this chorus of praise. In that moment, I could hear God saying to me, Drew, do you see from beginning to end? He was born a baby in a manger. He died a savior, and he rose as a king, the king of all kings. And without a doubt, it's true. And the question is, do you believe? Let's pray together. Father God, we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you are creator of all things. All things belong to you. We know that we need a savior because we can't save ourselves from our sins. And Jesus, you died to save us. But then we, we come to this moment and we say, are you the king of our lives? Are you the king of kings in our hearts? God, I pray right now for every person that they would realize that you are the king, but you're not a king who brings a, a dominion riding on a white horse. You are a king who brings peace in this moment, riding in on a donkey, reminding us that you have a mission, you have a purpose, and Jesus, you came to set us free. Father, I pray for anyone now that has doubts that they would renew their commitment to you or for the first time say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the king of my heart. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you see yourself turning away from doubts that you've been having and the door of faith begins to open, will you reach out to our pastor online? Will you let Pastor Liz know that things are going in, in the right direction? You've committed your life to Jesus. You've decided to make him king and Lord of all. We want to celebrate with you. We want you to know that you're not alone. Our online family is essential. We love you, and we want to see God change and transform your life in every way. Until we see each other again, take heart and be transformed because Jesus is alive. Let faith arise In spite of what I see Lord I believe But help my unbelief I choose to trust you No matter what I feel Let faith arise Let faith arise my champion's not dead, he is alive, and he already knows my every need, surely he will come and rescue me, God of miracles come.
Hi, everybody. It's Pastor Drew, and I'm from Bridgewater Church, and I am excited. Spring is coming. It's just beautiful outside today, and I'm reminded soon we will be celebrating Easter, the death, but also the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and I want you to be a part of it. There are three opportunities for you to join with us. Two are in-house on April 17th, that Sunday morning, we have two services, one at 9.30 and another at 11. The 11 o'clock service is also where we have an incredible ministry for kids. And then I'm going to be excited to see our Easter egg hunt following that second service right about noon. But you may not be able to come and that's all right. We have a wonderful online ministry that will launch at 1030 on Easter Sunday morning. So plan now, plan now to be a part of a day that will be remembered for all eternity. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. Easter Sunday, April the 17th, 3100 Princeton Road. Join us and bring your friends and family, connect with us online, and just know I'm praying for you. See you soon. Hey, Bridgewater Church family, and happy Holy Week. My name is Tracy, and we are so glad that you have joined us for worship today. There are so many ways to get connected around here, and we hope that you can be a part of it all. Check out this week's Bridgewater Buzz. This week is filled with special moments that we want to remind you about. Pray Where You Are begins immediately following the 11 a.m. service. Check out the calendar or online in the lobby to claim a prayer hour or to confirm the hour that you signed up for. This Thursday, April 14th, we'll be having a special Monday Thursday service here at the church at 6 p.m. An online experience will also be streaming on all platforms at the same time. On Easter Sunday, April 17th, we'll be celebrating together in person at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Our kids programming happens during the 11 a.m. service and there will be a family Easter egg hunt immediately following out on the front lawn. You can help make this an extra special event by bringing in bags of individually wrapped candy and dropping them off in the lobby. We can't wait to spend this transformational week with you. The outreach team is partnering with 17 Strong, an organization that focuses on caring for neighborhoods here in Hamilton 
for an all-serve Saturday. Join us on Saturday, April 30th from 10 a.m. to noon to help clean up the Riverview neighborhood. Kids eight and up are invited to join you, so this is a great opportunity to serve together as a family. Sign up in the lobby or email k at bwch.org for more information. Life Groups, this is our spring break week. We wanted to remind you that there will be no Life Groups meeting this Wednesday, April 13th, or on Easter Sunday. If you're not a part of a Life Group, this is a great time to get plugged into community as we head into our new session. Sign up in the lobby for more info and we will help you find the best fit for you. Thanks for joining us for worship today. God has incredible things in store and we love being a part of the Bridgewater community with each of you.